right. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm uh, very happy to welcome you to our lecture tonight. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Solomon Craig with us tonight uh, in our series of the Institute, ETA On. Uh, since roughly two years, we have a frequent lecture series discussing research, discussing relevant topics uh, of environment and technology uh, in architecture with uh, a very exclusive uh, invitation of guests. And this, this time I'm very happy to welcome Solomon Craig. He is currently assistant professor at the School of Architecture, the Faculty of Engineering at McGill University in Canada. Previously, um, he has been at Harvard in different positions as a lecturer and researcher. Um, he comes from a background in product design, but then focusing on engineering and actually doing his PhD in engineering in London. He has a background also in practice, which of course is uh, very exciting and interesting for us, uh, applying these concepts on exciting buildings. Uh, and in his research, and this is why we in invited him, he in a very unique way combines aspects of physics and technology with architectural design and construction and researches on the implications between this interaction of these fields and, and with the aim, of course, to create uh, new solutions, new research for buildings and how they can be more environmentally friendly. So welcome very much um, from my side, Solomon Craig. Um, the floor is yours. Um, and yeah, maybe you want to start sharing your screen. Thank you so much, Arno. I'll, I'll endeavor to do that right now. Okay. So can I confirm that you, you can hear me and that you can see my, my main slides? Okay, good. Right. Okay, so I'm calling this uh, upgrade to, to draw down. Um, so it's a, it's a real, uh, just a second, I have to set something up. Okay. Um, so I know it's a real honor for me to be here virtually today in, uh, in, in Switzerland, because <laughs> I think um, the ITA at ETH is, is really at the vanguard of the kind of technology development the industry needs. I know your research group um, has been pioneering building design through the lens of the second law, law of thermodynamics for some time now. And another example, the block research group have made significant advances in form active structures, uh, material structures that are tuned to the flow of stresses. And I think we would all agree that it's important to start developing monomaterial structures that can orchestrate flows of heat and air too. Uh, so my research group is only now starting formally, but I've managed to make a, a bit of progress over the last uh, few years working with some uh, fantastic collaborators. And I'm, I'm going to start my presentation with a quick summary of this progress leaving links to publications so that viewers can follow up afterwards. This is one of the advantages of, of, of uh, an online lecture that's, that's being recorded. Um, so since uh, 2016, my collaborators and I have been pioneering a thin film uh, microfluidics for, for low grade uh, heating and cooling in buildings. And we think this, this new platform technology can in, help improve access to ambient heat sources and sinks, such as the sun, ground, and infrared sky, and that it can also increase the degree to, to which natural ventilation is feasible during summer or, or, or winter. And then it, 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 what, it, what it's doing is minimizing uh, the material that you need, but also being able to intelligently maximize the surface area that you have available for, for radiant slash convective uh, cooling in, inside a building. and, and as you know, Arno, like the, the, the bigger the heat exchange surface, uh, the, 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 more, um, the, the more useful low-grade um, heat sources can, can be in, in controlling in, in interior uh, climate conditions. Um, here, here, are, here are links to, to work if people want to, the publications, if, if people want to follow that up. Um, Another axis, uh, since 2017, my, my collaborators and I have been pioneering the engineering of building envelopes that work as heat exchangers, not uh, insulators, uh, starting from a structural material and optimizing air channels in it using a method from aerospace engineering. One significant recent finding is that wood, because of its low thermal conductivity, 
is the only standard construction material able to he exchange heat to incoming air at a feasible rate. And I'll talk about this more later, but that, what I mean is an exchange rate that can meet current U-value standards without leading to overventilation, um, you know, without external ins insulation. And we think that integrating functions for structure, heat exchange and ventilation into mass timber in this way could help simplify building sim systems and help reverse the global trend of increasing emissions from the construction in industry, which is essentially the subject of my talk today. Um, here, here are uh, lectures, uh, sorry, uh, references for, for, for you to, to follow up on with links. Um, another axis is uh, since 2019, uh, my, my collaborators and I who see there, um, we've made some pretty significant advances, I think, in, in thermal mass design. We have shown how to optimize the surface area and thickness of an internal thermal mass in a feedback loop with buoyancy ventilation. One significant outcome of this research is, is being able to define how much more wood is needed to perform the same thermodynamic work as a concrete thermal mass. And as is well known, thermal mass is a prime candidate for integration with structure and a cost-effective way of avoiding air conditioning and blackouts during heat waves. Um, everything, everyone thinks they know thermal mass, but we think we have shed new light on how to design with it with our, our recent work. And here are here are references to publications, but also, also apps, um, Wolfram apps and, and a grasshopper definition, which I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll show some of the implications of, of, of this new framework for design later. Um, and and a, a, an emerging axis from, from a research group, um, since this year really only, um, my collaborators and I have been begun to use experimental fluid mechanics, uh, saline baths, Schrillen imaging, and the principles of dynamic similitude to investigate novel buoyancy ventilation schemes. We have demonstrated the ventilation dynamics of a historic hospital and have pilot tested an innovative scheme for natural heat recovery. And here, here I'm, I'm sharing the pilot data for, for those research, uh, for the, those research researches. Uh, in, including uh, videos, which, which you're, you're, you're free to uh, download on my, from my Dataverse to, 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 to have a look at. And what we're interested in, we're interested in these natural thermal feedback loops uh, for ventilation because we think they represent significant uh, untapped potential for harnessing ambient energy and designing thermally resilient buildings. We're also very interested in exploring the architectural qualities of these what I call heterothermic interiors and how they might influence occupant behavior. Um, so I, I'd invite you to follow those up uh, as you wish, but and I'll talk a little bit about, about them at, at, at the end. But now I want to pivot to where our, our, our research is headed. Um, so the, the long-term uh, goal of our, our emerging research group is, is to develop integrated biomaterials and value-added supply chains that can obviate in the order of a gigaton of CO2 emissions per, of construction-related emissions per year. For context, a gigaton is a, a billion tons, which is roughly the mass of all land mammals other than humans in the world, or roughly the ma twice the mass of all people in the world. So one gigaton per year is an absurdly large amount of CO2 emissions to try and avoid by design. But that is a scale to aim for if we have any chance of making a noticeable dent in construction-related uh, emissions. That, that's the sort of challenge that we, we have. Um, here are the big numbers to, 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 to keep in mind, where, where, that, where that number arrives from. Um, so about 1,500 gigatons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today is due to the legacy of human activity since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, today, these activities are intensifying, adding uh, approximately 40 gigatons of CO2 to the and we're adding uh, approximately 40 gigatons of CO2 to the atmosphere each year. Uh, of that yearly rate, uh, approx uh, um, approximately 16 gigatons is because of energy use in buildings. Uh, uh, these emissions will fall if, if nations retrofit old buildings and shift to renewable energy but I'm more concerned about the impact of, of new construction. 
because the pro production of new uh, materials, mainly cement, steel and glass, is responsible for about four gigatons or approximately 10% of global emissions. As the world's population grows in the coming decades, driving demand for new construction, these so-called embodied emissions are likely to, to dominate. For example, some analysts predict we will cover the area the size of Manhattan Island with new buildings every month for the next 40 years. And while we know how to make new buildings more efficient over their lifetime, that the carbon emitted to produce new buildings is, is irredeemable. So what we're interested in is, 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 is whether or not um, it is possible to transform this potential threat to the global climate system into a powerful means to mitigate climate change. Could, could all these new buildings act as, as global, a global carbon sink? Uh, scientists and practitioners are starting to realize the potential of new building stocks as a global carbon sink. There are a range of materials that can store carbon or CO2, but only two that are in widespread use in the construction industry today. Timber grows by photosynthesis and may count as sequestered carbon if the forests are well managed and the products are long lived. Meanwhile, the concrete curing process can be tailored to absorb more CO2 while, while the CO2 from producing cement can be mineralized in the flue and used as aggregate. Uh, according to recent estimates, timber and concrete could each store in the order of half a gigaton of CO2 each year, assuming there is proper coordination of their production cycles around the world. These potential quantities put new building stocks on par with other front runners for utilizing atmospheric carbon in the technosphere. Now, we're interested in both forms of carbon utilization, of course, in, in concrete and in wood, but I, I must say I have a preference for wood. Uh, and the, the simple reason is that it, it I guess you could call it the, the, for the, uh, the aesthetics of the ecology of it. Uh, the simple reason is that it grows by photosynthesis. It's magic process um, that uses sunshine to suck carbon out the air to make a super material at ambient temperature while moving water from the ground to the atmosphere. You just imagine if, if evolution didn't invent this process, that a scientist invented it instead. If you were an investor, you would absolutely back that person. But there are many complexities associated with biogenic carbon, especially on the forestry side of wood production. Just to clarify, biogenic carbon is the carbon sequestered by photosynthesis and, and stored in biomaterials as they grow. In, in life cycle assessment calculations, wood structures generally show lower emissions compared to concrete and steel. Using wood in buildings is one of the best uses of, of, of the material wood as, as it locks in its captured carbon for a long period of time. For this reason, it's sometimes possible to consider wood as negative emissions while doing your, uh, your carbon accounting, you know, quote, uh, negative emissions. The tree sequesters the carbon, the building stores it, another tree is planted, and the drawdown cycle continues. Um, that's the theory, at least. It is important to use wood that comes from sustainably managed forests and to avoid wood that is harvested from primary old growth forests. However, beyond this obvious fact, there are still many unanswered questions regarding the temporal dynamics of biogenic carbon. For instance, what impact do different wood harvesting practices have on the carbon sequestered by soils? How does the growth rate change with climate uh, heating? What would the carbon sequestration have been if you left the forest alone? As another example, in 2017 and 2018, British Columbia's wildfires produce three times more emissions than all other industrial sources in the province. Climate change is making our forests more prone to large wildfires, and whether forestry practices play a role in decreasing or increasing wildfire risk is still an open question. What happens in the forest sector will have a huge impact on global emissions. Managed forests can be one of our biggest carbon sinks, but also one of our biggest emitters if we don't treat them the right way. What is clear that if we want to legitimately store carbon in buildings, we can't be satisfied with limiting our accounting to individual buildings in a piecemeal way. We need to think at the scale of forests, whole supply chains and entire building stocks. We need to figure out how to synchronize forestry activities with construction activities at the regional scale. 
part of my lab's research will be to work with forestry, forestry scientists uh, and other colleagues at McGill to, to understand these larger scale dynamics better, uh, starting with local forests in Quebec. And in fact, we've just won a grant to, to do that, starting with a carbon inventory of the Ar Arboretum at McGill. Now, there, there are lots of researchers and practitioners pioneering work in this area. And I'd especially like to give a shout out to the Carbon Leadership Forum, who have done a fantastic job at raising awareness of carbon accounting blind spots. But what I want to speak about today is, is design. That is, the radical design changes we could make to building assemblies that could help us make the most out of biogenic carbon. So in my view, building assemblies are ripe for, for radical integration. The organization of building assemblies into different subsystems, for me, reflects the organization of labor and knowledge in the industry, right? more than it does some epitome of technological evolution. So when the schematic, schematic design settles, the different teams need to be able to work somewhat independently on their allocated parts. This way, this way of working helps ensure projects get done, but the effect of this uh, the effects of this process are unsustainable. This fragmented approach has produced a surfeit of over-specialized materials from a globalized supply chain, flooding the market to fill niches that need not exist. Suppose instead um, we design timber elements, so one form of biogenic carbon that gives structure, that, as well as giving structures to the building, but they, they also provide low-grade heating, uh, cooling and ventilation not by adding dissimilar uh, materials, but by shaping the wood to optimize exchanges between heat and air. Then we could radically simplify building assemblies, negating the emissions from cladding, insulation, ducts, air conditioning, and all the hidden materials you never really think about. Um, so one-to-one -one substitution of, of biogenic uh, products is, is good, um, right? For example, the mass timber, um, the, the, the the, the mass timber panels could, could replace con concrete um, structural walls, but one-to-one -one substitution is, is, is not enough in my view. Um, we need to move towards, I think, uh, monomaterial structures, or at least material structures that can replace as, as many other materials, products, components, and systems as possible. So an, another way to, to explain this uh, design agenda of upgrading to draw down is, is to develop integrated biogenic building materials that exchange heat and fresh air, that, that harness ambient energy to, to simplify building systems, obviate emissions and store carbon for, for centuries ahead. But what do I mean by harness ambient energy? I'm, I'm gonna give uh, two examples uh, by other researchers two recent breakthroughs in, in, in building science before, before going on to my own examples. Um, so the first, the first uh, brilliant example of harnessing ambient energy is, is, is natural mixing ventilation. Um, and the energy saving potential of, of, of this effect was characterized for the first time in 2009 in a paper by Andy Woods, Sean Fitzgerald and Stephen Livermore of Cambridge University. And, and we have prepared a, a video to, um, uh, to explain the, uh, the effect, which I just, oh, sorry, of course I did there, um, which I'll start in a second. So just to, this is context, we've immersed a, bottle, um, a model building upside down in a water tank uh, using saline, salt water to simulate, simulate rising hot air, all the while ensuring that the, the Reynolds numbers were representative of the flow dynamics at, at full scale. So what, what you're going to see here is a, it's, it, the, the flow behavior is dynamically similar to what would happen in a real um, uh, building, but it's, it, it, it's, it's sped up. And the, the video starts with an explanation of, of dis buoyancy ventilation, simple buoyancy de ventilation, displacement ventilation, here with a single heat source. So you see, see the ink represents the, the the, the, the air rising and and you can see uh, it, it leaving uh, and, and then and then coming coming in at low level here with a mixed heat source you could see the fresh air um, uh, entering more clearly it's really the art of filling and an emptying uh, uh, filling an emptying box 
Okay, and if you know that if you know how much heat you have being generated in the building and the height of your building and the size of the openings, you can you can regulate the, the amount of ventilation to what you need, right? To how much ventilation you need. Here, though, is the, the uh, a, a fantastic discovery: mixing ventilation. Um, so the bottom openings are closed, and now only the top openings are open. Okay, and the hot air, of course, wants to leave, um, but it, before it can leave, fresh air has to replace it. And there's only one place uh, where that fresh air can come, come from, and it's the same opening, right? It's the same opening. You clearly see that with the, the zoom in there. And the, the reason why that's so, so ingenious is that, um, that um, if you imagine a, a, a fairly cool day, it might be as cold as 10 degrees Celsius out, out, outdoors. Uh, the, the warm, stale air leaves, and the, uh, but it, um, passes some of its heat to the fresh cool air entering. So the fresh, the, the fresh air is preheated by the outgoing uh, warm air. So it's an, a natural mode of, of heat recovery. And what this discovery has allowed um, engineers and, and designers to do is to extend the period of natural ventilation into the, into the, into the cooler months. Uh, the, the pioneers of this are really bre uh, breathing buildings in the UK and, and, and there's many installations in, in, in schools and uh, other, uh, other, other buildings across the UK happening now uh, because of this discovery. So that, that's a, a, a natural form of heat recovery, spontaneous, that where you're using, we're using the, 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 the physics and, and knowledge of how air, air moves and, and warm air behaves to, to, to harness our ambient energy and recover it. The, the second discovery I want to talk about is how, how termite mounds harness ambient energy for, for air conditioning. So there have been a number of hypotheses to explain it from wind powered pistons to metabolizing turbines to solar powered chimneys. But scientists always had trouble getting direct measurements because termites will attack any probe that enters the mound. But in 2015, one team of Harvard scientists overcame these difficulties, taking measurements inside a live mound for the first time. They studied the mounds of a particular species in India, which tend to be built in shade and away from wind. And they concluded, to the surprise of many scientists, that the thermal mass of the material was the thing that regulated everything. It was the, the actual thermal mass uh, of that mound. And they have the reference to the breakthrough study there, but also, also an, an, an article I wrote where I interviewed the science, uh, scientists um, in telling the story of, of, of that discovery, if you want to, to learn more. But now I'm, now I'm going to explain how the, the thermal mass uh, um, controls the interior climate um, the, uh, and powers a, uh, a cycle of buoyancy ventilation. Um, so here's a, here's a simplified section of a, a termite mound. What you've, got to, what you've got to realize is that, you know, um, it, the, the whole purpose of the mound is, is, is not so much uh, for the termites to live in, uh, well, that's important. It's, it, the, the primary purpose is, is for them to harvest fungus, right? They're, they're, they're one of the world's first farmers. They, they, they invented farming, farming for uh, humans. So the termites themselves are pretty re resilient thermally, but the, the fungus needs to be kept at, the, at, at, at pretty um, uh, strict temperatures uh, and, and, and moisture levels. And most importantly, it, it also needs, it needs uh, constant uh, replenishment of, of oxygen, okay? So th we, we should read the, all, the whole morphology at the top as this sort of air conditioning apparatus for, for the fungus. Um, and the, the way it works is, uh, is, is as follows. Um, so the, during, okay, all right, it, I see a mistake there. I'm putting, uh, this is daytime, all right? It says night, but it's, this is daytime, <laughs> right? Um, the, so during the day, um, the exterior mass um, heats up in contact with the exterior air as that's warming up, okay? The interior mass, um, that, is, that stays relatively cool, okay, because the, the heat hasn't had time to, to penetrate yet. What that does, it sets up a buoyancy ventilation cycle. So the air in the external chutes rises in contact with the, uh, with the warmer mass. And then it falls centrally um, in contact with the, with the cooler mass, all right? 
and during the 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 night time here this is again this is night time not day my, my typo there um, the cold air uh, the the mass towards the exterior cools down more rapidly right and while the mass at the interior um, it is still warm so the cycle flips and the reason this is significant is 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 that it, the termite mound is is using the, the external temperature oscillations to do thermodynamic work to move that air uh, around and around and what that means is that um, um, carbon dioxide produced by the the fungus can be transported with that conveyor belt up to the top of the mound uh, where the that um, carbon dioxide can then diffuse through special pores at the top of the mound and where fresh oxygen can can diffuse back in right so that, that's the, the big conveyor belt that that moves the move, moves those those um, that carbon dioxide uh, out um, but also while also retaining moisture and regulating the temperature internally okay so we've been looking at how how to um, how to, I get um, to to couple buoyancy, ventilation, and thermal mass in a similar way, in a in a more sim in a simpler way than than with um, uh, termite mounds, but the same essential cycle nevertheless. So coupling thermal mass and, and buoyancy ventilation in a natural feedback loop. Um, the, the the first thing to say is that your your building doesn't have to look anything like a termite mound for it to perform like one. Right. That's 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 really really basic. What's what uh, you know and uh, what what we're, what I'm interested what I was interested in what I still am interested in is what what proportions what what sizes what surface area what thicknesses of thermal mass do you need in order to 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 synchronize those two two processes right uh, so what proportion how do we proportion the internal thermal mass to get the amount of ventilation and interior temperature we want okay. In 2019, working from analysis by Holford and Woods, I found how to synchronize uh, thermal mass and buoyancy ventilation, those two uh, uh, cycles. Um, that is how to optimize an internal thermal mass so that for any chosen free running temperature, you can maximize the buoyancy ventilation it produces. This contour map uh, summarizes the results uh, and the blue line, uh, blue spine running down the middle represents optimal designs. Okay, so I'm going to take 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 through that. Um, the 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 contour lines are the relative interior temperatures. So the highlighted line represents the infinite number of thermal mass designs that will achieve a relative damp temperature damping of 0 0.7, and and the damping effect of 0 0.7 is illustrated on the graph on the right. Okay. Um, so if, if I had a damping effect of, of one, I, you know, my, my, my interior temperature and my thermal mass temperature would completely flatline relative to the exterior temperature oscillation. Uh, the omega parameter on the x-axis expresses the, um, the rate of heat storage compared to the rate of surface heat transfer at the interior surface. You can think of this as a tuning ratio. Um, it tells you how well the, the, the mass is tuned to the frequency of heat exchanges to and from the surface, in and out over a daily cycle. Uh, the F parameter uh, expresses um, the ventilation heat exchanges compared to the rate of surface heat transfer. Um, this ratio tells you if your thermal mass surface is large enough to produce the ventilation exchanges you actually need. All right. So if we have, uh, if we look at uh, designs on, on the left of the curve, like, well, what would that represent? That would represent pretty lightweight thermal masses that don't produce much ventilation, right? And then it, if we look on the right-hand side, that would be uh, very heavyweight thermal masses that don't have enough surface area to actually prove, uh, pr produce uh, the ventilation uh, that you want. That, that, that you that you went to the, that you need, but those in in the middle would would represent the the optimum, right? Mm -hmm. So um, where where you're you know the 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 surface area of the thermal mass, internal thermal masses, and the thickness of it is such that 
on a per cubic meter basis of material, you're extracting the most amount of thermodynamic work. It's, it's how you, you're, it's per mass producing the most amount of ventilation for that given interior free running temperature. So we have, we have summarized these scaling rules in a, in a, in a free to download uh, Wolfram app and also in a, in a, in a grasshopper definition. So you can, you can choose the thermal mass material, uh, the temperature damping and the rate of buoyancy ventilation you want your mass to produce. Again, so this is very important. It's like, okay, the mass is actually producing the ventilation. Right? Uh, um, and then the app will return the optimal thickness for that mass and, and the surface area required for that internal thermal mass. Okay? Um, so you, you're, uh, you're welcome to, to, to download that, those and, and play with those, but, but I, I wanna show you what we can do with them a, a bit, just to give a hint at the game. Um, the, 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 the interesting massing games you can play with these new scaling rules. So just as an example, um, when, when John, Jennifer Bonner was designing House Gables, um, you know, and I spoke to her about this, she, wasn't, uh, she was not thinking about how to use mass timber panels as thermal mass or how to power a cycle of buoyancy ventilation with those panels. But now we can ask, uh, when do these CLT roofscapes start doing the same thermodynamic work as, as concrete? And here's what the results look like uh, for uh, a, a small building, right? The, the size here is defined by how much ventilation, ventilation the mass produces and how many people this rate uh, would serve. Uh, in this case, the mass produces enough uh, ventilation for, for 10 people and, and, the, and the temperature damping for both of those massings is the same. So it, it, it turns out here that wood can do the same thermodynamic work as concrete, but you need, in this case, 80% more surface area, which can be taken up by the, the gabled roof. Um, no, notice here, I'll draw your attention to the, to the embodied carbon uh, values and, and how, they, how they range from negative to positive, uh, over a huge range, uh, actually. So on the, the, the negative end um, represents the, the, the carbon storage opportunity, but then the, the, the positive end of it represents the, the risk as well. So, um, the, the final value will depend, of course, on where, where you source your wood from and how confident you are that that forest as a whole sequesters net carbon over time. Here's, here's a medium building defined uh, uh, as an internal mass that produces enough ventilation for 50 people. Uh, so the, the required surfaces increase substantially for both massings, but, but the wood massing still needs 80% more surface than the concrete massing. So uh, this multiplication factor of 1.8 um, changes with the temperature damping that you choose. So if I, if I in, increase uh, the damping coefficient, I will, I will both, both massings will need more surface area, uh, but the multiplication factor for wood would, would, would increase too. Um, finally, here are the results for, for a large building serving 100 people. Um, I'll draw your attention to, to another detail. Uh, notice the error associated, associated with the surface area. For the wood massing, the error is as much as 400 square meters or 16%. Or, or and that's because I've used generic thermal property values for softwood with, with a large uncertainty range. Uh, and, but of course, you can use more specific thermal property values um, what, once you've specified the actual materials and, or maybe done measurements yourself. But, but generic values are, are fine for early stage design. I contend. Here, here are the, the summary of those results showing how everything scales. Uh, so it, it's really important just to emphasize that these pairs, all these pairs perform uh, equivalently. The same free running temperature, the same rate of ventilation production. And this is important because in, in life cycle analysis and in carbon accounting, you can't do a fair comparison unless you have a well-defined functional unit. So I'm, I'm working with a team of researchers at Rural Studio at Auburn University in Alabama and Annie McGill to test these uh, scaling rules in, in real life. On the left are some pilot data for small pods, uh, a meter high, confirming that the coupling works. You can see the swing of buoyancy ventilation produced by the wood thermal mass. It goes up during the, the night, down during the day, predictable like clockwork. And on the right, you see plans for larger test buildings, which we intend to build this coming spring. We hope to show definitively that wood thermal mass can perform as well as concrete thermal mass, so long as you have the right extra amount of extra surface. Now, of course, that's, 
um, you know, that, that's a headline that's important, but what's more, more important uh, for, for me is, is demonstrating the validity of these scaling rules, because I think they, they could have a, a real influence in, in, in early stage design, okay? Um, so there will be times when, uh, when doubling the amount of thermal mass surface just isn't uh, practical. Especially, um, so, so we've been looking at how to optimize, um, we've been looking at how to optimize surface patterns to increase the, the rate of heat transfer on the surface. So in 2015, I, I worked with a master student, master student Jared Friedman, uh, to translate the theory of heat sink design to, to concrete panels. And we found that you can't adjust the surface patterns arbitrarily. You can't simply increase the surface area how you wish to whatever pattern. There are strict thermal scaling rules to follow. These features need to have, uh, the surface features need to have negligible thermal mass. The conduction through them should be close to uniaxial. And the spacing needs to be just right for the convection boundary layers to kiss. If the surface patterns are out of scale, the performance quickly becomes worse than a flat surface for, you know, the, holistically for thermal mass. But if you respect the rules, you can increase the surface heat transfer two, three, or four times, depending on the conductivity of the material uh, that you're working with. So we've since uh, updated that, uh, the analysis, and you can see with the, the, the app there on the right, which we'll be publishing soon. Um, We've been looking for surface geometries that will work for wood and other biogenic materials. And our initial results suggest that we could double the heat transfer, surface heat transfer with thin surface features, similar, to, for example, to the ones produced by this finger joint router, although there are many other fabrication and uh, possibilities and, and patterns possible. So in theory, we, could, we should be able to produce biogenic thermal mass panels that per unit panel area really do perform perform as well as concrete that don't need the 80% the of extra roofscape, for instance, if, because uh, that will be important for, for some projects, I, I imagine. And then, of course, there are other, other things that we could consider. I mean, what it, well, the, the, the acoustic properties of, of these surfaces and other interesting things like that. And, and another, we're not abandoning the concrete. I think that's, uh, that's very interesting, especially when you start to consider whether, whether those features can play a, a stiffening role. Uh, as well. So here, here are the, the links for that, uh, that emerging uh, body of work which you can follow up there. There's the, the, the publications, the interviews, but also the, the open source uh, apps and, and, and Grasshopper definition and pilot data that, that you're, uh, I invite you to, uh, to have a look at. So my, the last project I, I want to speak about is our um, research project is uh, envelopes as heat exchangers, whether, whether we could uh, fundamentally change the, the thermal organ, organization of buildings by, by turning building envelopes into, uh, from, from insulators in, into heat exchangers. Um, you, could, you could think about the thermal organization of buildings fundamentally trying to resolve this conflict, which, is, which goes back thousands of years. How, how do we... Uh, how do we retain heat or internal energy uh, while, while bringing in uh, fresh air, right? How do we resolve that conflict? It flips the other way in, in cooling, but that's the, that's the essential uh, conflict. The modern approach to, to resolving this conflict is to super insulate your envelope and, and make it airtight. Um, then, then use mechanical ventilation and uh, most importantly, a heat exchanger so that as you bring the fresh air in, the, the, the heat in the stale air uh, um, comes into thermal contact with that incoming stream um, and can pass its heat to that incoming, um, incoming stream of, of fresh air. And that's what the, where the heat recovery lies. With the video I showed you earlier, that I, I showed you a, a, another, uh, another approach to, to dealing with that uh, conflict, resolving that conflict. So, um, that was mixing ventilation. The idea that outgoing uh, um, warm air uh, could preheat spontaneously incoming uh, a fresh air. But what, what this project is about is whether or not we could um, we could apply this uh, the heat uh, decentralize this heat exchange principle to the actual envelope. 
So it, it would work, work something, it would work like this. So you have um, in, in modern construction, you have an airtight wall that's insulated and heat goes from, uh, from in to, to out. Let, um, let's imagine there's this some rogue pores in the in the envelope, some some channels where where air is is going to infiltrate. We we look at that closely. We can imagine the, the fresh air, cold air coming in, and and the the heat conducting out through the envelope. There's bound to be some slight heat recovery effect. That is, some of the some of the heat will will bend is liable to bend towards that fresh air and to preheat that fresh air. So the idea here is that whether or not we could we could actually optimize a, 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 a porous envelope structure so that um, we balance those two heat flows, right? The, so the the amount of conduction going out is balanced by the the heat carrying capacity of the convection coming in, and and you you put them into good enough thermal contact that you can re, you can recover recover the the outgoing heat before it escapes to, to fit the material to the flow. So it, it's this Goldilocks uh, proposition, you know, the, if, the, if, the, if the holes are too big or it's, uh, the, the void fraction is too big, um, you know, the, there isn't gonna be enough thermal contact between the, the incoming fresh air and, and the material itself to, to have a significant, for, for the fresh air to, to rise significantly in temperature, right? Equally, if it's too small, that those holes are too small, there's gonna to be too much pressure difference to overcome, too much friction to overcome. But if you get the, it's just right, that if you, for a known pressure difference, say four pascals, six pascals, what have you, can you optimize, um, can you optimize the, the size and spacing of those channels so that you maximize the amount of, of, of heat exchanged from, from the material uh, to the incoming air? Um, and the answer is yes. So, it, so it, after my PhD back in like 2009, um, I actually came, um, and before I embarked on a, a career as a consulting engineer, um, I came across this paper, which actually made me wish I could start uh, doing my PhD again. It described some correlations for optimizing channels in any material uh, to improve the heat exchange performance of things like turbine blades, which need to be kept cool in extreme thermal conditions. I, I looked at the, the correlations. I thought that there was potential to translate them to the design of building envelopes. And it wasn't until 2015, uh, 16, 17, working with Jonathan Grinham, uh, then uh, who I was co-supervising a PhD at the GSD, um, that I got a chance to test the theory. So uh, John, um, John fabricated samples in, in wood, concrete, and glass, uh, standard construction materials, um, uh, and this uh, millifluidic panel as well, which we, with which we um, control the surface temperature, the interior surface temperature of each of the samples. And then we, we measured the total heat exchange while pushing air through the panels at a range of pressures. Now, we weren't designing these materials to, for them to actually have like feasible heat exchange rates or U values that were actually feasible, uh, uh, really feasible in construction. What, did we, what we wanted to do is simply test if the, comp uh, if the correlations did translate from the extreme conditions and the thermal conditions and pressures of the, the aerospace context to things that were in, two ranges that were in the, um, two fluxes that were in the range of, 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 of building environments. The, these were the two correlations that we were testing. So they show how to optimize the channels in any solid material so that you can maximize the heat exchange effect when sucking air through the panel or, or any fluid. Um, so the variables in the equations account for the thermal properties of the material, the thickness of the panel and the applied air pressure and, and heat flux at the interior surface. Uh, given these inputs, the, the bottom equation tells you how to optimize the channel dimensions and spacing. And the top, while well, the top equation tells you what heat exchange performance to expect, right? And this graph was the climax of our paper. It's, it's, it's the first empirical validation of these corre correlations in the entire scientific literature. Um, more significantly, the, the, the data show that we can, we can actually use the equations to design heat exchange envelopes in, in everyday conditions using everyday construction materials, or at least it's worth searching, it's, it's worth searching for. Um, so, um, 
a, a, a project that we've uh, started recently is, is, is to start to um, um, apply these correlations and, and design feasible mass timber um, panels, uh, which give us the, the, the new values at uh, ventilation flow rates that, that we're after. Um, it's been fantastic to work with Rural Studio uh, so far, and, and, and there's, a, there's a, pre, a link to a preprint of the, the work that we've been doing uh, linked down there. Um, it, 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 once we had defined the correlation, shown that the correlations were valid, the, the, the next thing, of course, is to, like, so what, what materials and, and what geometries are, actually make sense? And it, and it does actually turn out that that wood is better suited to this kind of heat exchange than other structural materials such as concrete. So the Sankey diagram on the left explains how the heat exchange works. The top arrow um, shows the conduction through a normal envelope, straight through from in to out, right? Nothing complicated about that. But as the bottom arrow shows during heat exchange, some of the conduction is rerouted to the incoming airstream, that, that, red, that red line. Uh, that heat is uh, is technically recovered, but you have to put in more energy upstream to make it worthwhile. Um, you have you, that. That's one of the reasons we integrate a thermally uh, active surface into the inter interior surface. And when you analyze the heat exchange potential of different structural materials, it becomes clear that wood, because of its lower thermal conductivity, is the only standard material able to exchange heat to the incoming air at a feasible rate. That is an exchange rate that can meet uh, U-value standards without leading to overventilation or needing to overheat the, the interior surface. So this app, which is free to download, shows the effect of, of surface heating, thermal conductivity, um, and suction pressure on the optimal geometry and heat exchange performance of, of wood panels. The analysis suggests that with standard thicknesses of mass timber, uh, 15 centimeters or there or thereabouts, um, uh, we can approach passive house U values with a ventilation flow of approximately 10 liters per second per square meter and a surface heating coefficient and the interior surface below four watts per meter square per degree Kelvin. Um, here you see the heat exchange concept applied to mass timber in more detail. Notice how the conduction flux turns towards the incoming air you need to fit the form to the flow, otherwise there is no chance of eliminating the, the exterior insulation. The scale of the channels really matters here, but it's all, all governed by those correlations. They cannot be too big or too small, and they need to be spaced the right distance apart. But once you are within the right range, small deviations don't matter that much. It won't matter if, for example, the, 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 the channels like expand or contract by, by a, a, a few hundred microns or, or what have you or even millimeters. Um, but with, with wood, the optimal challenge, channels are approximately two millimeters in diameter and, and, and 10 centimeters apart, right? De depending. I mean, it's parametrically defined, so, 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 so it depends, but that's just give you an example. Um, so uh, at that sort of void fraction, it, it would still feel like a, a, a solid envelope. Okay. Um, so this is one, the penultimate slide, I guess. Uh, so. One, one important question is like, how do we suck the air through the channels? Well, we've been investigating whether it is possible to do it using buoyancy ventilation right, to, to avoid having to use, to use fans. Uh, our first experiments show that yes, in principle, this is possible, that you can couple buoyancy ventilation to this heat exchange on, in the envelope. And we are, starting, we are starting to look at thermal ventilation loops like the one on, uh, like the, one on the right here. Um, uh, so that so that we could we could recover heat from the outgoing ventilation stream without needing mechanical uh, equipment. We we want to explore as much as possible the idea of a monomaterial building designed according to low grade heat recycling pr principles uh, that you would find in in a power station, uh, uh, for instance. And, and and of course we you know these these are pretty radical. Um, schemes and uh, you, you'll, you'll notice for example that for, for them to work there's the very different thermal zones uh, uh, within this nested building um, and we're, we're very interested to in actually lean, in, lean into that we're, we're very uh, interested in in what the behavioral 
uh, affects and effects would be with this kind of with these kind of heterothermic uh, interiors. So that's uh, here are here are, uh, um, for the record are are the uh, the latest references and links if you want to follow up with with, with that work. And I'll just conclude. Um, you know uh, the, the strategy of upgrade to draw down and it, it just um, emphasize that the need to, to aim for radical integration. My example is, is to use biogenic material structures that can, or to try and develop biogenic material structures that can harness ambient, ambient energy. But, but there, there are, there's lots of other um, areas of radical integration that need developing too. Uh, and we need to do that while working at the regional scale and we, uh, not, not more moving beyond just the, the individual, uh, the analyse, analysis of individual buildings. We, um, for my example is, is, is we need to, to explore the temporal dynamics of storing carbon in synchrony with managed forests, but, but there are other examples of synchronising supply chains that, that, uh, and, 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 and ecological exchanges that we need to think about. And, and we also need to, to stay focused on the big picture drawdown, right? The, and f for, for my research group, that's the, that's the long-term aim of, of developing value-added supply chains that, chains that can obviate a gigaton of CO2 per annum of construction-related emissions. That those are the big number targets that, that we have to st uh, stay focused on. Um, thank you very much. That's where, where, I, where I end. Thank you very much, Salman. That, that was absolutely stunning. Um, very exciting work you're doing. Um, we have still some time for questions and feedback, so I invite uh, our listeners and participants um, to either use the chat or just uh, speak out directly until uh, people gather their questions and thoughts. I maybe kick this off with one question. So I think it's, it's absolutely fascinating how to use uh, kind of environmental potentials pressure differences, temperature differences to kind of harness this, this exchange. I was wondering, what is, what is your notion on, on human comfort, right? You're obviously, to use those effects, you're a little bit dependent on states of the outside and the inside to, to keep those flows and, and uh, potentials working in your favor. So that might be that relying on those principles only. There might be situations where you, you experience different comfort regimes inside of the building. So I was wondering to what extent that is relevant for your work um, and and if if this also implies that we might need to rethink how we think about comfort and and kind of tight comfort boundaries within buildings. Yeah, I think this is is it's such a um, an important area uh, area. Anna, thank you for uh, for raising it. You know, what, one of one of the advantages of 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 of, of now being a researcher. Um, Compared to when I was a, a building engineering consultant, is is that, uh, that I have a bit more freedom to to uh, to explore explore these boundaries at, at at the edge. Whereas, you know, when when you're working in in live construction projects, if you if you don't have other teams on board, if you don't have the client on board, it's very difficult to to push against the the, uh, the normative standards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but there's fantastic work happening with uh, standards are are evolving to 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 move beyond um, restrictive notions of comfort. I mean, one one example is the ASHRAE 55, which is the, which has been tremendously valuable, and, and the work of Richard Dedier and and Gail Brager and, and and others in pioneering that was has been essential. It was essential uh, for us when we were working on the Apple campus and Bluebook HQ at, at Foster and Partners. And, and I see some of my, my old, old colleagues here, it's great, great to see them there. And, and the, the work that we did in convincing the client and other engineers that we, we have to, 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 sh to shift our notion of what's comfortable, otherwise mm. there's no chance of doing it. That, that, that's really the on the ground activism that, that, that we need to do. Um, I'm really uh, interested in yeah, how behavior um, can couple with the, the interior climate. You know, I, my, uh, my attitude is that, okay, we should, look, we, should, we should look at the periods of the year when um, it is possible to, to rely only on harnessing ambient energy. Let's just, let's just say that, right? Mm. And, and, then, and, and then while also expanding our notion of 
of of comfort like um you know sometimes it might you might know, need to it it if you design a mixed mode strategy where some spaces are completely uh, passive, for example, and others might be assisted, then you can think about program in a more enlightened way. Perhaps the, the, the public spaces are, uh, are, are where that there's a, a wider threshold, people are coming in with their jackets or, or not. And, and so we need to think in space and, and time about, about the interior, uh, interior climates. Um, and, and then when it gets to more extreme weather, then, then of course, all right, if you've done your hard work in, in forming the building and, and designing it so that it, it works really well and resilient with, uh, with no external energy, right? Mm -hmm. um, then, then it's a question of working with the physical forces with, with assisting technology. Uh, I, I, think, I think that's the, the approach. But, but you know, I'm, I'm in a fortunate position where, where I, could, I could do re research and, and just start with okay what's thermodynamically possible mm -hmm. then we can start considering okay is, is that even feasible in terms of the occupation of buildings mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i, I also I, I strongly believe that we need to question certain situations and certain standards especially related to comfort and and see the benefit of maybe different comfort and different temperature regime regimes uh, within a building and and you 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 touched on the freedom of, as a researcher, however, you also showed very nice examples how you're trying to translate this to design. Maybe, and I, I see, I read your apps in a sense as, as providing tool sets to kind of make these principles available for designers. Um, and from our experience working with, with architecture students, it's always those principles to communicate them beyond just qualitative statements, so to say, and to make them somewhat tangible in design is a challenge. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that um, what function these apps and tools that you develop have and how much you can actually hand them over to designers to actually let this influence their designs? Yeah, it's, um, it's a great question. I, uh, you know, because it touches on, it touches on, for example, you know, what, 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 what are the, what's the role of, of, of intuition? What's the role of theory? Uh, what's the role of computation? You know, and, and, and you know, tools can navigate in, in between all, 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 the, all of those uh, areas. They can, they can help. Um, you know, what, um, I, I, I personally believe in, 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 pedagog in pedagogy, at least, like what, what, we, what we need to, uh, we need to start with from theory. And so what, what I would um, foreground first in, in for example, the, the massing app is, is actually, it's, 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 not, it's not a complicated computation uh, at all. It, it, it's, actually, it's actually just, just solving a set of equations, right? It, it, um, there's nothing clever uh, going on there. Well, the, the, the clever bit is in, is in the scaling rules and, and in the theory. And, and if, if, if you get that right, if you know how things scale, uh, bringing together different processes, I think that's more powerful than, um, than, the, than just to put it in the stream, the, 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 the black box, computation which which you input variables and, and then the answer is x or, or the answer is y because if you if you it's really important that um the the role of of discussion and conversation among different stakeholders so if if everybody can understand the, um, principles or scaling rules i think that's much easier to 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 move a project towards towards synthesis mm -hmm. right, towards synthesis um, the, the the tools have been very useful. The the, the apps, but we all, we always always emphasise to the students like you can't calculate yourself to the right answer, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's it's like you 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 can you we we it only is to facilitate you understanding the scaling rules, and then you are condemned to design. Exactly, right? you are condemned to design. I think that's really that's really important. Yeah. And I think. Um understanding the principles and then building up heuristics. I think w those tools can help building heuristics that you potentially then apply in a, in a very seamless and intuitive way. So I, I exactly. think this is how this could be very useful. Before I uh, keep on talking, are there questions from the audience from participants? I see some raised hands. Yeah, please fire away. You just need to unmute yourself, I think. Sorry. Um, hi, hi everyone. Hi Sal. It's hi, great, Gunnar, it's to, great see to see you. you. And it was amazing to see this continuation of research. I had a pleasure to work with Sal a few years back and this is amazing. 
Um, I was very much interested in the research you were doing in the thermal mass about the wood and concrete. Um, it's interesting. Um, I work in industry. I'm, I'm, I'm an architect and sustainability researcher. And we just lost a battle in one of our buildings because our consultants, they said, because of the thermal mass of the concrete, we can't replace it with the wood. It's just the, the old way of thinking and the old way of calculations. And I, I noticed today your research was talking about this increasing of surface area of the wood and you can actually get in comparable results. I'm interested to know a little bit more about that and how our industry and our consultant get, get hold of this tool and this understanding. Thanks. Yeah, we've been, yeah, we're, you know, like if you could characterize, thank you, Golan, uh, the, if we could characterize the, 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 the debate um, current debate about thermal mass and you know there are many good reasons to, 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 to talk about it and to, 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 to integrate in the right way but I, I, it's, it's, not a, it's not very sophisticated at the moment because we're, we're, we're trapped somewhere between rules of thumb or, or common notions about, about what materials work as thermal mass and what materials don't and then black box computation right we're, some, we're somewhere in, in, in between those what, what, I, what I hope this research can 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 give is is a, a, like a middle way where where upfront in early design you um you can um it you, you have the right functional you you have a fair basis for comparison so it's like oh yeah wood can do the same amount of thermodynamic thermal mass work as concrete it just needs x amount more material and then at least that's basis for a rational conversation rather than just like uh, wood doesn't work concrete does right so that's that's what i if, if anything i hope that's the where the main contribution lies right yes uh, other questions yeah i had a question about this is kind of dumb but did you do any tests on like what happens to the interior humidity of the spaces when you're using a porous envelope like that or even um the water content of that envelope. You, do you mean the uh, with the, the breathing walls, the, mm -hmm. the exchanges? Yeah, not mm -hmm. not yet. We haven't got to the. We haven't. We're still very much at the uh, material physics uh, characterization stage. So we haven't yet got to to larger scales. But there there are. I'll say this. There there are many um, it, having a heat exchanging envelope rather than an insulator completely changes the, the vapor transfer dynamics, right? the vapor transfer uh, um, characteristics. Like, you know, it, it, with, with lots of layers, it's, it's always a problem about you have to track the vapor transfer and make sure there is an interstitial condensation and, and all of this. And, and it, this is different. This is com completely different. So there are many open scientific questions that each, each merit their own PhD, which is something as a researcher, researcher I'm really excited about. For, for example, with wood, you know, how can, can, the, um, can the wood um, absorb uh, in moisture from the incoming air, right? Um, and, in it, and, and then can we release that in a, in a way that's useful either inside or outside later? Right, and so these are these are some of the, the interesting questions that we're just starting to scratch the surface of. But it's it's just a it's a it's a new it's a new and open area. Thank you. Each and each material will 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 have different propensities for for moisture uh, um, and um, like harnessing uh, latent heat transfer um, compared to others. Would you look into? Um because you're using wood and it's a biocompatible material, like would you look into things like the biofunctionalization of that material, like using living material systems in it? Oh, oh and in, uh, sorry, what was that phrase? It, bio like biofunctionalization. So you'd like actually giving functionalization from like a biological organism in your material system. Why not? Why not? Wow. I mean, why not? Yeah. Do you, do you have an, is there an, is there a particular idea that, that comes to mind? I mean, that, that sounds really interesting. Um, well, that's kind of my research interest, but yeah, like uh -huh. different types of bacteria or like fungus that can use, maybe cohabitate on, on a wood substrate. You know, why not? We, you know, we, we tend to, when we, when we look at new technologies, we tend to always think, oh, like 
uh, house or you know that wouldn't work in my you know but there, there are many uh, of course types of buildings and 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 why not yeah you know i'd be very interested in that as a kind of as a as a kind of te temp template or, or scaffold for, mm -hmm. for for cultures mm -hmm. interesting well I, I think what is really interesting that that on many levels uh, what what you do it has a very strong notion of context and location mm -hmm. So this aspect, I mean, as you mentioned, right, if you need, for example, humidity to get removed, you need to have these oscillations in humidity and temperature to actually make this happening. So it has a certain geographical context, yeah. as well as, as kind of sourcing the raw materials, right? So, so the question of scalability and to, to uh, which locations on this, this globe these principles might be applicable. And, and I mean, certainly there is locations where wood is, is maybe, maybe uh, more difficult than, than, than for, for example, in Canada. So, yeah. so, but I think it's it's a very interesting contextualization that comes back from using these type of principles. There is agreed questions in the chat. Let me just uh, a question from Dari. Have you ever tried fungus farming, vertical foresting wall? That seems specific. No, uh, but you can. Um, no, I haven't. Tell me more, and 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 maybe maybe we should collaborate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The, the second question is um, that's that's uh, probably related uh, research you're doing relevant to only certain geographical locations. Yes, uh, maybe maybe you want to elaborate on on that. Well, you know, um, so there's there are things that are scalable and then there are things that are, are are not scalable. And and what um, you know, for example, those those correlations that I showed, like if you if you parameterize the um, the heat exchanges properly, then there's no reason why they, 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 they shouldn't be scalable and, and movable to different locations. The, the, the art comes in, in in applying them correctly and, and for example, to, in, to be able to engage local material supply chains and, and work with, with, with those, um, those material cultures and, and how things uh, are, are produced. And so, and, and for example, understand like uh, the limitations of fabrication in, in a, or opportunities for fabrication and, and try to try to work uh, work with those right mm. uh, yeah so I, I you I want my my goal is to 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 abstract anyone's goal our honors goal as well I think it, it would be fair is to to, to always um, uh, characterize what is generalizable right and and then and then we can do the hard work of, of applying it locally that's where the design comes in mm -hmm. yeah I, th I think this this aspect of scalability is is becoming a really pressing one also with other bio-based materials the question how would you even i mean that, that is the the fascinating and and scary part of construction that is just such a huge amount of mass involved right it's yeah. just so much material that you need so Whatever approach you take, I think is it's relevant that it has the potential to scale. Otherwise, we will not reach those goals that you that you indicated. Exactly. Um, there's another question: Have you ever thought about integrating the radiative cooling technology with these designs to maximize natural ventilation and cooling? Reza is asking. Yeah. Yes, I yes I have Reza. Thank you. And and it's actually a, a, a project that I, I want to start. Is is what? Okay. So you know. With the thermal mass buoyancy ventilation coupling, um, you know you've 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 got a, a stable fluctuation o o over over time. What I what I'd like to explore are the dynamics of when you introduce a source of cooling into that, and whether you could successively go down, so that that your your interior is is actually cooler and cooler compared to the ambient. So you've got you've got an, an, a nighttime heat sink. But if we add another heat sink, for example, the night sky to that system, what happens to those coupled dynamics? And the, um, the microfluidics or millifluidics or, or any kind of hydronic system could be a way of coupling, um, the, coupling the interior of that, that building to, to the infrared sky, for, to, for example, or the, or the ground or another source of natural uh, cooling. So, what what I'd, I'd like to do first is is to to just to characterize the dynamics of adding a source of cooling, uh, which might come in in different, um, which might have its own time signature, 
and so the, uh, the, 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 the dynamics would be uh, interesting. Then we can start to think about like, oh, okay, well, that source of cooling is, com for example, coming from X or, co or coming from Y. Great. Um, then there's a, another question from uh, Valeria. Maybe you want to, it's, it's a long, before I read this out, Valeria, maybe you want to uh, post those, uh, so basically yeah. ask the question yourself. Yeah, so thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. And I was wondering, for these systems to work, you actually need um, precise proportions, uh, geometrical proportion, both for components, but also for spaces, right? For architectural spaces. And I was wondering if you see these systems more efficient in a certain building type, in a certain program, let's say, and also if there are ways that we can somehow revise the traditional building types to allow these technologies to work more efficiently. I, hi, Valeria. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. I, um, um, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't got to the stage where we're sort of like, oh, we're, we're, we're very confident about these technologies and now let, let's, let's think about typologies and, and, and where exactly we can make the biggest impact. We haven't got to that, to that stage. I, um, but um, certainly for the, for the breathing walls, right? But um, the, the, the thermal massing principles, I, I push back a bit on, 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 on the needing to be precise. I mean, I, you, I, I showed you like the, the the error the error on on the surface area needed for the error on the surface area for the wood thermal mass for example it's like sixteen percent for the sur surface area right and um, there's and and there's no I'm, I, it's not telling you how to distribute the surface the, the thermal mass it's actually there's a lot of freedom there you know it could it could be on the floors it could be on the ceilings it could be right it could be partitions it could right you know that it I would I would argue that it's very loose loose fit what's more, more important is that that you you get the, the the proportions correct what what matters is that it's you know in in that case it was 800 square meters and and, and not 300 square meters right um so and if you if you look at the the rules on that contour map right you know it might not matter if you if you it might not matter that you can have like for example if you look at the app more more closely you'll see that oh sometimes the optimum thickness is 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 too thin for for it to be structural okay uh often if you look at software the the, the uh, like the thickness required might be like optimum thickness might be nine or ten centimeters when really like mass timber comes comes in 15 centimeters or, or something like that but if you understand the, the the theory you can you can like you could say that oh okay well i could just thicken it enough till it's structural um, and, and just sacrifice a bit of ventilation or a bit of temperature and that's okay but at least you at least you at least you're doing it in a in a in a, in a guided way right so I'd, I'd, I'd argue that that the most powerful ones are, are, are those principles where, where we're actually we're not too quickly saying it's 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 only for this type or that type but that there's room for creativity to, to interpret them and how, how to apply them <laughs> Because I was also thinking about using uh, temperature gradient as a as a for, force to for heat exchange. So basically, I guess in that case, you also need to consider the floor heights and other proportions of the space that you want to to cool. Yeah, with vent, with with the fluid with the fluid dynamics of the interior, like yeah yeah that that's really that's that's really rich. Um, you know that the that's that's uh, included in the thermal mass coupling um, app uh, but only a bulk flow rates right but once you start to look once you start to get to the organization of space you know that could really matter right that you might you for example you, you don't want to cut off uh, you don't want to cut the cut off the route for for ventilation to, to go through and and the way if you partition space in a certain way you might get certain hot spots that don't get ventilated or or, or other things um, but what I would say is that if you have a, an understanding of, of how air wants to move, um, that you can, it could be quite simple that the way that you organize or change the organization of space just to, uh, just to allow that, that global pe behavior to, to con continue, right? Thank you. And there's a, a raised hand from uh, Sana Ramezani. I don't know if this is uh, still ongoing, uh -huh. if so, yeah. Just... Mm -hmm. 
yes really? yes yes uh, hello thank you for the interesting presentation dr craig uh, i had a question uh, about um i was uh, just wondering is there any consideration in the strategy for the prevent the entrance of urban microorganism into the inside environment of buildings uh, through the pores of the walls I'm sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Asana. Could could you repeat the question? It was quite it was, it was quite difficult here with the the. Crack. Yes. Yes. Sure. Um, is there any consideration in the strategy everything was to prevent the entrance entrance of urban uh, microorganism into the inside environment of in buildings? Not not yet. Not yet. And and so uh -huh. what, what what's a you know a, we you know what once. We're at the stage now where you know with this, there's still some important um, thermal characterization to, to be done, right? So we've 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 thought um, we've identified wood as, as as very promising. We've identified that we can we can get the steady performance um, that's uh, competitive, right? With just just mass timber, and then we and we've identified that you know the um, the, the channels are in the order of, of a couple of millimeters in diameter and 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 at about 10 centimeters in spacing depending on 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 how you play with the variables right uh, depending on what targets that you you want to get um, but we still have to do some other work we have to we have to characterize the transient transient performance of the transient heat exchange more, more precisely we have to we have to we have to more carefully Characterize and identify buoyancy flow states in in the interior and and possibilities for ventilation heat recovery. Uh, once once we've identified potential schemes, I think or outlined schemes, then I think we can get into the nitty gritty and and really important aspects of okay, how do you keep bugs out? How do you you know the, these kinds mm -hmm. of things? But it, I, I, at the moment they're they're sort of secondary because we 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 still have to. Uh, identify if, if this is even thermodynamically worth pursuing. Mm, yes. And uh, Dr. Craig, I have another question. According to the professional, uh, your professional experience, uh, I was just wanting to know for which climate do you recommend these technology printing walls? Um, for example, some areas are so windy and uh, even I uh, just want, uh, want to know if you consider the effect of uh, the uh, outside environment, uh, including temperature, winds, uh, and uh, uh, such things on the uh, optimization you have done on the, uh, the pores of the walls. Uh, well, yeah, but only, um, you know, only to the extent that they're characterized in the correlations, right? But you, so you, you, you mm -hmm. have, you, you, you have, you have a, 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 you can connect to a definition of climate insofar as, 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 as those, uh, insofar as you have the therm thermal parameters, the climate related parameters in, 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 in those correlations. But as I say, that's, yeah, th those those questions are for me are 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 more standard design and engineering rather rather than um, mm -hmm. fundamental research questions, which which is you know that um, the industry needs academics to, to to work on 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 fundamental research questions, and that's uh, right. Mm -hmm. And then and then once you've identified possible uh, technologies, then then you can start doing the important um, uh, detailed engineering. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the novel uh, ideas that you had and the interesting presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We, we have uh, two more questions in the chat um, and let's, uh, let's make those the, the last ones. Um, uh, Pratyusha is asking, I recently learned about structures called yakchals that were used in desert for cooling. They would use sort of spiraling ventilation inside the structure to bring temperatures down significantly. Do you think aspects of this research can be linked to something like that? That's that's a, a, a nice question. I, I you know yak, yakshals were a bit of a passion of mine. My PhD was in radiative cooling, not sky radiative cooling. So I, I I looked at those a lot. And actually, Gol, Golnaz here who asked a question earlier. We we, we were speaking about. Um, uh, Persian ice makers before. Actually, there's a lot of misinformation about how yak shells work. P people look at this amazing egg dome structure and, and try to intuit how it could uh, how it could like spontaneously make ice, and they and they and they miss they miss the 
the trough, the, 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 the shallow pond uh, next to it. Mm -hmm. it, it. It was really just a case of like fi filling in the water, which is, might have been half, half a meter deep, and letting that cool by night sky radiation to the atmosphere and, and, and make ice, making ice and then, and then shoveling, shoveling that, that into, into the actual just for storage. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, um, the, and, and, and I did some analysis actually of like, you know, what, what was, what was, what was the, the, what was the, what would have been the right timing? Did they collect the ice every, every day or would they have left it to, 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 to grow over a week, over a week or a month? Um, so I, I did some work on that, but the, in terms of, uh, how the yak shells keep cool. I mean, primarily like ground coupled, and then and then the the just the latent latent heat in that that ice, um, and then and then yes, being able being able to vent being able to vent at the top with just one opening. What I suspect what I suspect happens is that like you that what that allows is fresh air to come in, but then cold air to stratify down below, so so the air is colder nearer to the ice, and then in, any heat that does. Um, accumulate in inside and perhaps from 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 the sun baked mass does have a chance to to vent out um and perhaps there's some local mixing at the top without disturbing the, the stratified air layer cool air layer down below mm -hmm. great and then one final question from alexander jacobson who also raised his hand so maybe you want to ask this question personally yeah i thought i'd jump in if, if you can hear me hi, Alex. Um, hi i saw it's good to see you again Good to hear you. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have a webcam, but I wanted to to dig into a little bit of the progress on um, the the, pos the possibility for wood to um, temper the uh, the temp like the thermal fluctuation inside of a of a space. It is like the size of a small tree trunk enough, where like if we you had a bunch of trees in an atrium. That that could have a measurable effect, or does it need to be larger than that, just in the, terms of proportion? Hey, Alex, it's a good, um, great question. Like you know, because we, I can talk about the limitations of of the scaling rules and and the model. So the, it it only is it assumes only one dimensional heat transfer. Like it, like you, you've got to imagine that the 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 heat going into the mass and then out the mass, but it's only in any one way traffic. So okay. any 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 elements like like. Beams or or, or 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 like edges or or tree trunks that gets into two D or three D heat transfer, and and the complication with that is that when you can have thermal thermal conduction waves which start to overlap, and then and then then they're weakened, right? So um, you, I'm I'm sure there's a way of looking at um, uh, the coupling of of two dimensional features such as cylinders with with the interior air just 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 haven't haven't done it so i don't know what what, what the results would be cool Does that help, thanks Alex? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It, it for the surface for the surface uh, features we you know it, it was it was all about like okay uh, defining features where, where actually it's on the whole more or less one one dimensional heat transfer like got it Otherwise, you just have to do like crazy computations and it doesn't become like a fun scaling rule game yes. anymore. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sal, for this great talk and the great discussion. Um, I think we, we had a fantastic insight. Thanks for everyone uh, listening and asking questions. Um, and this would conclude this, this lecture. Um, big applause, big round of virtual applause to Sal. Thank you very much. And to all of you, uh, stay healthy um, and hope to see you back in one of the next lectures. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.